content length which indicates the number of bytes that I am about to send. So this is the request header followed by backslash r backslash n backslash r backslash n and then followed by the payload. And the payload is this, these 100 bytes. So the server patiently reads everything that I sent and then let's say I was uploading an avatar uh, for my forum uh, <coughs> account. So then it will take this file, save it to some directory and use it for my forum profile. Can you perhaps have a, an intuitive guess what this attack is going to be about? Just save that at a directory in your system. Mm, okay, other guesses? Change the lag. Yeah. So, and the other keyword is slow. Now picture this. I am connecting to the server and I'm telling the server, hey, I'm going to send you one billion quintillion trillion of bytes. <coughs> so I send a very, very, very large number here. The server says, okay, according to the protocol, uh, I have to take this, I have to parse this string. So at some point they look for content length, uh, then they split the string by the column, then they extract this number, and somewhere in the code, in a very, very, very rough uh, sketch, you would have something like malloc to allocate memory for storing that data somewhere in RAM, and that <coughs> number of bytes mm -hmm. which need to be read. Mm -hmm. Because you can't write directly to the hard drive, you have to buffer it in RAM first, and then write it to your storage. Mm -hmm. So, Effectively, what happens is that somewhere here, let's say this rectangle represents the RAM mm -hmm. of the computer. And now I say, allocate that many bytes. So it allocates those bytes. Even, uh, so at, at this point, we have just this. But I can send a few more requests of this type. And in a short while, it has no more RAM for processing other types of requests. And then we use the same trick as in the previous attack, that is the slow part. I am going to send this huge thing to the server at a very relaxed pace of one byte per 10 seconds. So what this means is that the server will be forced to keep this memory occupied for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, when somebody else wants to upload a file, the server would have to allocate some more space, but because all the RAM is now being used by my requests, it cannot do that. Yeah? Where do you specify the time? One by uh, where do you specify the speed of the yeah, upload? Yeah. Um, so, normally, your programs, for example, your browser as a client, will send it at whatever speed it can. Mm -hmm. How much is available? All of it is used. So to pull off such an attack, you would have to write your own little program, which could follow the same, uh, the following logic. For example, let's say while um, some kind of flag mm -hmm. condition send, and you send this character from your Oh, okay, let's imagine that you have, do you know Python? Mm, okay, just forget about that. So you have some kind of a for loop that does this. For uh, i equals zero, i less than mm -hmm. some number. i plus plus and then send a random byte and then you do a sleep for okay. 10 seconds. 
or if it's in C, then it's in milliseconds. So basically, um, first of all, you send this header, and then when you have to send the payload, just send them random bytes. And be between every other bytes, sleep for 10 seconds. And that's how you force this pause, so, so it's going to be at a very slow pace. Where, where do we write this in our yeah. browser? <laughs> you, I don't know where to you, know, you cannot do this in your browser. You cannot. So if you want to actually implement <coughs> such an attack, it's very easy, but you need to know how to use sockets. Okay. And I can teach you how to do that, input but it will take reader, a while. Input stream reader, all that. Huh? Input stream reader, output stream reader, all that. Well, so it depends on the language the and the platform, language. but it's very easy. There might be some tools that, that, that can do this, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, there is OWASP. It is one that does that. Plus, the thing I wrote before, slow lawyers. Mm -hmm. Just go to slow Google this, and you will go to either slowlawyers.com or slowlawyers.something, which will give you uh, the page of this exploit. It describes the method, and it even gives you a short uh, Perl program that implements this attack. Wow. So even if you are not a programmer, even if you don't understand the protocol, you can just take the file and run it, and maybe you get lucky. One more thing. Uh, the, the message, the entire message, does all the message contain, do all the messages contain the content, content length, or only... Uh, Certain messages contain the content length or only post ones? Only post one contains. So the answer to that question is given here. Any post request has to have a content, a content length because the server needs to know for how long it has to keep reading. Um, in the case of this protocol, mm -hmm. we use such a marker to indicate that this is the end of the header. Mm -hmm. But there is no marker for the end of the payload. Because what if my payload contains backslash r backslash n as a part of the message itself? Mm -hmm. So that's why in this case, we don't use an end of payload marker, but we do specify the length of the payload in the header. Okay. So this time I'm going to let you think about ways to protect yourselves from this type okay. of attack. What would you do? Restrict the length of the message, I mean. Yeah, so that's the first natural thing one would do. Uh, let's say I have to serve, um, we were talking about avatars on the forum. An avatar is a picture that is, let's say, 50 by 50 pixels. It's either GIF or JPEG or something. So it cannot possibly be more than let's say 15 kilobytes. Just give it another delta, you know, just in case somebody uses a very beautiful avatar. <laughs> but no way on the planet this thing can be more than one megabyte in size. So naturally, when somebody sends you a post request where the content length is set to a number bigger than this threshold, which we have established using common sense, obviously something is fishy. So that's one method, yeah. So there's also another possibility where in the sleep command they can uh, mention the number of milliseconds to be really large. So limit the number of milliseconds in the sleep command. But why do you need a sleep command? If okay, so wait. No. So if this, is, I think can you change that command? We cannot, right? Okay, wait. We can't change that. <laughs> no, not the command. Let's take it one step at a time. So let me comment your comment first. Uh, this is on the client. It's oh, the program that sends that. the request. Yeah, yeah. But if you think about it on the other end of the connection, the server also has to keep reading bytes in a loop. Mm -hmm. And it would be reasonable if the server had some kind of a timer. Uh, a timer. Yeah, so when I get the first byte of my request, this, the first byte, I, st I start a timer. Mm -hmm. And let's say that on average, it would take me... 15 milliseconds yeah. to receive the whole thing. If it takes more, 
than let's say 30 seconds, then obviously something is wrong. So I can just disconnect it. And then... Yeah, I was saying the same thing. Uh -huh. Okay, and then you raise your hand. So I was just saying it was a bit line side. We cannot change that sleep command from the client. No, because the client is outside of our yeah. jurisdiction. Like I told you, um, the client is over there. Between us is just an interface. And all I have is the input data that the client gives me. I have no control over how that data are generated. Yeah? So when you talk about the client side, mm -hmm. which programming languages do you think are appropriate for such Python? Okay. So my favorite tool for such stuff is Python because Python can be read almost like English poetry because it's beautiful. Plus, Python forces you to write nicely. For example, you notice what I did here, I have this for loop and then I indented this code to the right, so I visually indicated these two actions happen inside the for loop. But in C, nothing prevents you from writing it all in one line, uh -huh. without spaces, without anything, so the compiler will happily compile it and execute it, but a human won't figure out what it is. Whereas in Python, indentation indicates hierarchy. So uh, just to, okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, so just to summarize between the two attacks, overlapping ranges and slow post. Uh, mm -hmm. Overlapping ranges is a header level attack. I mean, it takes place at the header of a message, whereas slow post is, takes place at in the body of the message. Mm -hmm. Or if, if the content length is present in the header, then it takes place in the header. Well, I wouldn't try to define it as it takes place in the header or in the in the payload. This is what happens. This is the message you receive at the application layer. Mm -hmm. Now, how you divide this message is now the problem of whoever defined the protocol. But from the perspective of a network stack, it's just all of it is at the application layer. Okay. So you just say it's an application layer yeah. attack. Uh, yeah, yeah it's a little bit off topic, but mm -hmm. um, if you can just give us a brief comparison from Python and Ruby. What's the difference? Just in mm -hmm. a few words. Uh, Python is older. It has a more mature library with more built-in functionality. And there are a lot of third-party modules for Python already deployed, tested, documented. So that's one thing. Um, second, I programmed in Ruby just briefly to see what it is. And at the time that I tried it, there was no nice IDE for it. Uh, the documentation wasn't that attractive to me. Whereas in the case of Python, this was much more mature, refined, and tested by time. Uh, so that they use Ruby in website design, right? Yeah, but you can also do that in Python. Actually, you can, you can make a website in C if you want to. Uh, I can explain how. There is such a thing as CGI beam. You probably yeah, saw this a billion times. Mm -hmm. So what this does is that is the following. So there is a program. It doesn't matter which language it's written in. Whatever you write to this standard input, the program takes as an input parameter, and whatever the program prints on STD out is sent back to the client as a response. So all I need to do is I need to write a program which at the STD in takes something like that, parses it, and then at the output give me some HTML code. And it doesn't matter, I could write it in assembly if I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, just this one last question that I have. Uh, I had done socket programming. Uh, what I wanted to know is while developing the application, mm -hmm. suppose if I develop the application in Python, I will have to know the address of the server when I'm yes. when I'm developing it. So how does a person who wants to attack, for example, say uh, say some bank, mm -hmm. ABC bank or something like that? He will have to know the address of that bank. So what you does he enter? He enters his IP address there and he directly. Mm -hmm. 
Because so, uh, if I'm building an application that does an attack like this, then how, how do I go forward by finding there out is what server it is? a protocol called DNS. Yes. It's responsible for taking a name like bankofamerica.com mm -hmm. at the input and giving you an IP address at the output. Mm -hmm. So, in your case, you don't have to worry about that because when you call the connect function of your socket, you can give it either an IP address or a human readable address like bankofamerica.com and it will be converted to an IP at the lower layers of the network stack automatically for you. You don't need to take care of that. Okay, and when I do a stream writer or something like that, and if I keep on writing it, so the, there should be a kind of a reader on the other end of Bank of America, right? That well, in the case it. of in the case of HTTP, mm -hmm. the reader is the HTTP server. Okay. Apache, Microsoft IIS, or you can even implement your own web server, as long as you follow the rules of the protocol. Okay. You need a break? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't care. You can go to the next one after that, you can take. Uh, okay, I will tell you one more example about a path traversal attacks and then show you some demos and we call it a day. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, let's call this a break. You can ask me informal questions. <laughs> so, uh, all this is not legal right <laughs> excuse me none of this is legal right to perform such an attack and all that uh, depends yeah it nice. depends so there is no uh, rule in the constitution that says you are not allowed to send post requests for which the content length is above 5000 for example uh, so I would not take the responsibility of giving you legal advice because this is not where I'm competent and I could lie to you and tell you something which wouldn't be correct so I'm not answering that question mm -hmm. but it would be interesting to find out so from like from a security perspective like uh, someone's trying to become an information security engineer or someone who's responsible for security mm -hmm. it's nice to know all of these things right of course but it's impossible to know everything right yeah it is so what do you think in this? how would I deal with this? Um, so one thing that is important is to know the fundamentals and understand the concept of protocol, interface, network stack, such that if something goes in an unexpected way, at least I know which keywords to use in Google to find the right place. So for example, in the case of HTTP, you will just have to read this RFC. Of course, it doesn't hurt if you know how sockets work and if you know the things I told you today about network stacks and abstraction, how it changes. So that's why normally in my regular course, I spend a lot of time talking about the basics. I share jokes, references to movies, because unless you understand the basics really well, you will not be able to use this fundamental knowledge to invent new layers of defense. For example, I could tell you that uh, to protect from this uh, have an upper bound for the content length and to protect from that limit the number of ranges you can specify. But what if there is some new type of attack and you wouldn't be able to protect yourself from it unless I told you exactly what to do. But when I told you where to look and when you have your own common sense and some creative uh, skills, you can make your own stuff. So, you know, someone said that if somebody is hungry, I can give them a fish and feed them for a day, or I can teach them how to fish and feed them forever. So I think it's much more important to teach you how to fish than to give you a fish. And there are newsletters and different blogs which discuss these kind of things. So once you know how HTTP works, 
I mean, if all of us here were familiar with HTTP, all I had to do to explain how these attacks work would say, indicate many, many, many ranges in the ranges and send the request one byte at a time. Or in the case of POST, just use a big number here and send it very slowly. And that would be the end of it. But it wouldn't make sense because, you know, uh, knowledge is like a puzzle. And a puzzle is made from different pieces. And each time I give you a new piece, you have to integrate it into the big picture. Because if it clicks with the rest, it means you understand it. But if I give you a piece, and this piece is somewhere here, whereas the rest of your knowledge is completely elsewhere, there is no connection between them, and you don't know how this information affects everything else that you know. This one smells really nice. So, like, uh, when, when do you prefer to use Python over C, and when do you want, prefer to use C over Python when you want to, to develop an application? Well, in this case, I would never write it in C. Because if I were attacking someone, I'm not interested in performance of code or whether on my client this program takes 10 megabytes of RAM or just 5 kilobytes. My objective is to bring the server down. So the priority for me is to spend less time writing, less time debugging. And in this case, C is not your weapon of choice. So what would be? When would I write what? something in C? No, what would be? Ah, Python, for example. Python. Yeah. So, the, is it necessary? Okay, fine. All right, I got it. No, but continue, yeah. Let's see. So, if at all, so, do you think Java and all these object-oriented languages, they will also support such an attack, right? Any language would be, would let you implement that. In fact, I have to take my words back. The best language is the one you know better. Okay. I mean, you don't have to learn Python to implement this. If you are very good in Prolog, or, I don't know, there is a language called White Space. Have you heard about it? White Space? White Space, yeah. It's about tabs, backslash, R's, backslash, N's. <laughs> anyway, so if you know that one, use that one. Whatever works. Whatever takes less effort, less time, and so yeah, the best instrument depends on the case. Um, what are your other questions? I would love to hear about the buffer of the uh, attacks. Yeah, uh, uh, but not today. I mean, at least not before we are done with the rest. So you have a question, yeah? No, I mean, I was just reading about um, a, a range request and I was just trying to understand more about it. So, uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, so it said, like, you know, you have a possibility where you can also uh, uh, mention a range request as part of the head, head, head request as such itself. Like, mm -hmm. not mentioning it in the get or in specific accept range request, but mentioning it as a part of the main head request itself. Well, this. Yeah. This is the yeah, header of the request. Okay. There is no super header. All, okay. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And I can give you another very, very simple example of uh, an application layer attack against the product, <coughs> against a server which doesn't exist anywhere except on the computers of one of my students. So uh, they were given a challenge to write a program that takes some kind of a sentence at the input. It contains some arguments. Oh, yeah, they were working on a shared whiteboard program. So you would have a program running on multiple computers, and somebody would move the mouse on a canvas and draw a line. And this line would be rendered on all the computers at the same time, mm -hmm. and they could draw in parallel. So they had to invent their own protocol, mm -hmm. just like we did here. So to draw a line, you need to know the x, y coordinates of the first point and the, the coordinates of the second point. So between two points, there can only be one line. 
So their protocol was designed in such a way that you would form a string, like for example, 0, 0. Um, so let's say they did it like this, 0, 0, colon, 10, 10. So this would be x, y of the first point. This would be x, y of the second point. And inside, so this is the client. It creates such a string and it sends it to the client. Uh, to the server. The server receives this string, and let's say it's stored in the variable called message. Now you have to parse it and extract these numbers from it. Uh, you could do it in multiple ways. For example, you could say, give me uh, the zeroth character, and this would be this point. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight. This is the index in the string. Uh, the index of the second uh, number would be two, because one is for the comma. Mm -hmm. But this would be an ugly way to do this, because in this case, for example, the number takes only one character, but in this case, it's a two-digit number. So how do you know how long you have to read? So what they did is they did this. They split the message using a colon as a separator, like this. And then, for example, in Python, the split function returns you a list. Mm -hmm. And the list would contain these two elements. And then they would split each of them okay. using the com. And then they would get another list with this, just this one, just that one, and so on. So what do you think I did when I saw this definition of the protocol to make their program crash? Increase the size of the number. Mm, you can do this in a much easier way. Reverse. Make this bigger and this smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it like this. So, x will be a list that contains two elements. So the first element will be zero comma zero, which is a string, and the second one would be another string, ten comma ten, and then somewhere else in their code they would write something like first point equals x of 0 and second point equals x 1, so the second element here. Now I could make a custom program that sends them a message that doesn't contain a column. Now the split function if you know how it works, if it couldn't split anything, it returns you just one element with the whole string. Yeah. But at this step, you're trying to access the one element, but there isn't such an element, so the program crashes. Cool. So, so very simple. Everything has to protect, you have to make some input verification. Yes, you must always <laughs> check your input, because the bad guys will always send you bad stuff. Yeah. For example, if you uh, read the definition of uh, how ranges are defined in HTTP, mm -hmm. you would see something like um, range colon integer dash and then optionally another integer to indicate the end of the interval. But it doesn't say for example, what happens if I send it a negative number? How will the server react? It depends on how it was implemented. For example, if the server naively just takes this number and then call a, calls the malloc function and gives it that number to the input to allocate that memory, then it depends on how malloc behaves if I give it a negative number. Mm -hmm. Or let's say, um, that the range um, is something 
that doesn't fit. So, for example, you know about the constant max int. It is equal to 32,768, somewhere around that. Where did that come from? I think that's the range, two ways to something. The range. Mm -hmm. Yes. 16, yeah. So, if I use 16 bits for my numbers, then the biggest number I can store is this. Um, so assume that I know that the server is using the integer data type uh, when it parses the request and it keeps that number in its memory. Now I know that if I send it this number, it won't fit into that integer. So what normally happens if you know about how numbers are stored, you can imagine them, the, the number line, so this is the number line. We have one, two, three, one of them. Now imagine that I took it and I, I connected this here. So um, if I send you this number and you don't have enough bits for it, then you make a full circle and this number becomes just one. But if you were using, so that would be true if you were using unsigned numbers. But because it's signed, then after 32,768 uh, follows minus 32,767. And what would happen if malloc were called with a negative number? It depends on the compiler, it depends on the platform. But you can always experiment and see how it works. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, can you repeat that? When, when it becomes signed, 32, 7, Okay, so imagine becomes... that you have declared your variable in your C program, and it looks like this. Int A. Mm -hmm. So, if it's just like that, mm -hmm. then it's a signed integer. Signed mm -hmm. integer. So, it can be either positive or negative. negative. If I declare it as an unsigned int, mm -hmm. then the range is more. The basically. range is bigger. It's 65,536. Yeah. 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 Uh, the way these numbers are stored, there is a standard that explains how that works. Um, that refers to floating point numbers. I forgot the name, but it's IEEE -E -E, uh, 950 something. I think. Anyway, it is the standard that explains in detail how a computer stores numbers in its memory. So when you receive a bunch of bits, you know how to interpret them to convert them to this or to that, or if it's a floating point number, then something like this. So the idea is that a protocol does give you some rules, like the format is this, a number dash followed by another number, and optionally, you can even use a comma to indicate multiple ranges. But if it doesn't specify any additional constraints for those numbers, then what happens if I send it some tricky stuff? It's up to the guys who implemented it. As in the case of my students, they did not check no. if <laughs> this thing really had two elements. So they naively assume that every client out there will always send them nice, properly formatted data. Mm -hmm. But using a very simple example, I showed them how I can crash their program. This would effectively cause a denial of service attack because any program that was supposed to draw this line on the screen, it would crash and they wouldn't be able to draw. Now imagine that I were some company that sells this drawing program to customers and people pay me thousands of dollars per month to use, to use the program. And some person writes a program that sends such, such a bad message every five seconds. Mm -hmm. So even if the program crashed and you started it again, in five seconds you will receive another message and... So every time he sends such a message, the server crashes. 
Well, the in this naive caches. implementation, yes. Cool. It could throw an exception. Well, it depends. It depends on what you wrote. The program does exactly what you wrote. It doesn't do what you want it to do. It does what you wrote. Sometimes what you thought was going to happen is different from what is really happening. So it takes experience to, to see the difference. Yeah? How do you, this is not based on this topic, but I want to know how, how do you, you, do you do botnets and all that? I mean, how do you connect to other people to make them perform such an attack? Wow. It's a very long story. <laughs> and I think it would be counterproductive if we tried this today. Because one of the requirements for that would be to discuss no, this. Well, this is one example which you can rely on to achieve such an objective. But it will be a crime if I just told you okay. without explaining the fundamentals first. It would be useless. So let me go back to one more example. And that would be an attack called path traversal. And before I explain that, I have to tell you a few things about paths. So a path is something like this. That's a path. You've seen them a billion times. You probably also know that this is something you see in Windows. On Mac or in Linux, paths can look different. 